Great. Hello and uh, welcome to our talk on feedback. My name is Mark Ogilvy and I am the uh, creative director or a creative director at Jagex Limited. Jagex is best known for making the popular MORPG game RuneScape, which has just hit its 20 year anniversary and has made over $1 billion in revenue. And hello from me, my name is Laura Dilloway and I am the lead environment artist at Roll7. Before that, I worked at the indie company Inkle and Sony's Guerrilla Cambridge Studios. I've been an environment artist for nearly 15 years, and I've been managing small teams and giving feedback for about 10 of those years. Uh, weirdly enough, me and Mark have never worked on any games together. We actually know each other from a completely different kind of entertainment, musical theatre, where we often look more like this. Or this. It's true, true indeed. Um, at Jagex, we treat feedback very seriously. In fact, it's very unlikely we would be where we are without it. Our, our players are part of our development team, and if something is important to them, it's important to us too. Simply getting someone to play your game and asking how they feel about it, well, it's a really hard thing to do, right? We all worry on some level about what people think of us, but when you're creating something and you're putting it out there for judgment, it's somehow so much worse. Why, why do we do this to ourselves? Feedback is emotional. Whether we're giving or receiving it, feedback leaves us feeling vulnerable. It's scary and it's so tempting to go out of our way to avoid it, but it shouldn't be like this. Feedback is a really brilliant thing and helping to improve something can be hugely empowering. Learning not to be possessive over your work and to be open to feedback are probably some of the biggest challenges you will face in your career. This is absolutely a two way street, however. There are good and bad ways to give feedback in the same way that there are good and bad ways to receive feedback. The way that people treat you in either circumstance will leave a lasting impression and it's only by working together that you'll gain the best results. So tip number one, feedback equals growth. Would you make a cake for somebody's birthday with ingredients that they didn't like? No, not deliberately. You'd try and find out what they did or didn't like. Now, imagine that you're the person receiving the cake and you really, really don't like it. If you pretend everything's fine and you don't say something, you might get the same cake next year. What if you could give feedback to the person who gave you the cake without hurting their feelings? Because that person just wanted you to have a really great birthday. That's what we're talking about. Game dev is kind of the same. It's a pretty bad business plan to set out to design a game that nobody will like, and making a sequel with the same issues would be a disaster. If I, as a lead, don't let my team know that their work isn't the right style, then the overall art direction of the game will suffer, in the same way that the reception of the whole game will suffer if we don't listen to players telling us that they're having a really bad time. To get yourself started on the right track, try and change your mindset. Feedback is scary, it is difficult, and it is hard, but if you embrace it, your game will be better and you will help improve things for everyone. And that's a really great thing to be a part of. We talked just now about feedback being emotional and a lot of points in this talk will come back to that because honestly, it's huge. Learning to give feedback is a skill in the same way that learning to receive feedback is also a skill, but it's important to remember that not everyone is at the same point on their personal journey towards being comfortable with feedback. This is one of the reasons why empathy between developers and players is vital. The more you learn about what drives the other, the greater your ability to collaborate and reach your goal. Working with people who deal well with feedback is a massive joy because it totally takes out the stress out of the situation for everyone involved. Our second tip is to ask why. Now, You'll find that when you ask for feedback, it might sound something like, oh, oh yeah, I really like that character, or that bit was a bit too hard, or you should add more monkeys, or something random. Uh, that sort of feedback has limited use. What you really want to know is why they felt that way, why they felt it was hard, or what specific part they struggled with and why. How many times did they fail? How did it make them feel? What are they comparing it to? What was it about the character that made them feel that way? Where, importantly, were the table flip moments where the player would have just stopped playing and why? Table flip is a phrase we use quite often in the games industry. And is that angry moment where you would have turned the table over and your keyboard and your control pad on your mouse or whatever has flown all over the place. They're really important. They're emotional responses. And we, we want to know if and when they happen. 
Importantly, it's vital that you listen to the explanation rather than try and defend the content that you've made. Understanding your audience is really, really important. So make sure you really probe them. Don't be afraid to ask yourself why too. Understanding why you made those design decisions is an equally important part of this process. If you do that, you'll focus on the problem at hand and not the solution. Now that sounds quite weird, but quite often a person giving feedback will suggest how to fix the problem. They'll suggest a fix to their problem. It's what I call forum feedback. A player is unlikely to understand the game from multiple perspectives and won't give solutions based on those. Most often, that's not really what they need. You're going to have to understand the problem rather than just put the first solution to the problem into the game. Tip number three is to focus your feedback on the areas you've been asked to give feedback on. If you're giving feedback, understand what the developer wants feedback on. There may well be things that really obviously aren't ready, but if the developer didn't ask for feedback on those things, then try and set them to one side, no matter how annoying you find them, because they're just not the focus right now. If you're being asked about controls, it will be a bit unwelcome if all you do is comment on what the art looks like. Tailor your response around the areas that they have specified that they want feedback on. It can help if the developer gives a description of their original vision and asks you if your experience fits. The difference between their vision and your experience will help them gauge which things are working and which still need improvement. It's quite okay to, for feedback to happen in different stages. Sometimes you need to deal with one issue before another issue becomes clearer. You want to be able to control the outcome of any of those changes and the order that you address them in, because anything that you may do may have a knock-on effect on something else. Equally, a ginormous list of fixes can be totally overwhelming to receive. Focus allows feedback to be packaged up into manageable and actionable chunks and worked through logically. It's the difference between saying everything is broken and this one section feels really hard because I don't understand what I'm doing. There can even be incremental in-progress feedback along the way as necessary, such as, does this help? Is this too much? And so on. Just because someone has done something the way you think it should be done doesn't mean that it's wrong or right. Like, focus on the end goal, not how you get there, and trust that you will get there in the end. Our fourth tip is to wear a new hat. And, and really, this means uh, get, making sure you get feedback from a range of influences. Now, when we're looking for feedback or when you're looking for feedback, try to get that feedback from as many different walks of life as possible in different ways. Age, sex, play style, experience, even the time of day that content is played can be relevant. Don't just get feedback from one sort of person in one sort of way. If that's hard to do, try to put yourself in someone else's shoes and play through your own content. Whilst you might have identified a target audience, sometimes you'll find as well that your game will resonate with a type of person or player you simply didn't expect. The danger, basically, of getting feedback just from yourself or just from your team or even from someone who's played the game before is that they become desensitized to the experience. Whilst repeat, repeat plays can be useful, you definitely shouldn't rely on its objectivity. Remember, you aren't simply making a game for yourself. You need to have an audience. Tip number five is to give positive and negative feedback. Actively seek out both positive and negative opinions. You can phrase this quite openly. For example, tell me three good things and three bad things about the game, no matter how small. Or you could be more direct. What are you thinking when you play this section? Make it clear that there are no wrong answers and there are no stupid answers. If you want people to be honest with you, then it's really important to foster an atmosphere where people can speak openly. Giving positive as well as negative comments also gives more validity to each. Saying everything is great feels disingenuous, just as saying that you hate everything. If you do have bad things to say though, Delivery is everything. Remember what we said about emotions. The poop sandwich technique may sound cliche, but it is a genuine thing. At the very least, I would always try and end on a positive note. Even if all you can say is, I can see you've worked really, really hard on this, or 
I recognize that this is a difficult problem to solve and I appreciate that you're trying to make this better. Say that. There's always something nice that you can say. Tip six is to prioritize. Now you're gonna get a lot of feedback when you open the doors and it's hard to know which bits of feedback to listen to, but make sure you analyze them all. Understand why each piece of that feedback exists and then prioritize that feedback from your target audience. Prioritize those things that have the biggest impact on you meeting your original vision for the game. And consider the impact on your time and development efforts. The perfect scenario is a tiny bit of work with a massive impact, but it is very rarely that. If something is huge to do, but it has the potential to fix a significant problem that every one of your reviewers experienced, it's probably worth doing. Don't just do the easy stuff. You might end up implementing a whole load of feedback, but if the big problems are still there, it won't make much of a difference to the game's overall experience. Make sure you split up that feedback in different priority buckets and focus on the stuff that can really make a difference. As with all changes, once you, might, once you start listening to feedback, make sure that you keep referring back to your original vision for the game. Implementing changes can often change that vision. And if it does, and it can, make sure that you're doing it open-eyed. Now, remember, and this is the hardest thing to do, don't feel obliged to change everything that someone didn't like, especially if it compromises your original vision. Sometimes you've just got to stick to your guns. As a feedback giver, prioritize the feedback that meant the most to you. If it was an immediate table flip, make sure they know that. If it made you cry or laugh out loud, let them know. If it was something that you rushed to tell your mates at the pub, let them know that as well. Tip number seven is to edit. When you're giving feedback, write your notes as you play the game. Read through them again afterwards. Check that you're giving feedback on specifically the thing you were asked to give feedback on and in the form that it was asked for. Replay the various sections you made notes about to make sure you understand why you felt those things and edit your notes to ensure that you are clear in your thoughts. Sometimes you'll need to come back to something a few times or even put the game down for a while and then come back to it refreshed before you're able to put your finger on the crux of what's bothering you. Try not to overthink what you've written or distill your reaction too much. As Mark says, the table flip moment is super important. If you feel very strongly about something, that's great. Be emotional about it. Emotion is really, really useful. Just remember not to be an ass about it. I hate jumping is not very helpful. I hate jumping. Why can't I jump very high? I can't see what surfaces are okay to jump on. Actually, is pretty useful. Prioritizing your responses can really help target which issues need to be dealt with first. For example, I think I could get used to the jump not being very high, but not being able to see where I can jump in the first place makes me want to give up. If you've written a lot of negative things, don't forget to add something positive to you. Lastly, remember that if your opinions on a topic were invited, they are relevant, no matter how small or inconsequential you think they may be. The developer might have a very different view and think something's really important. Be clear, just having a good command of written communication goes a long way. Try not to waffle if you can help it. By trying to be overly nice about something, you can confuse the message. And in the worst case scenario, people won't know how genuine your feedback actually is. So they may end up having to discard it and your voice won't, voice won't be heard at all. Tip eight, and this is the most important thing as far as I'm concerned in this entire presentation. And that is to get feedback as soon as possible. Get feedback when you can do something about it. This is the one area that I see most Games Jam projects fail on. And I, I, I can't I, I can't emphasize this more. Game developers, all game developers, nay, all human beings don't want to show people stuff that's unfinished. Humans will work right up to the last minute to perfect something they are really, really passionate about. And this is fundamentally wrong. I can't say this enough. Do not look for feedback when it's too late to do something about it. And do not assume that everyone will love the thing that you have made. 
I always allow at least 25% of your total development time to implement feedback. And that is a minimum. If something is unfinished, that is okay. Just tell your reviewers. Don't be afraid to ask a reviewer just to give feedback on one part of the game and ignore the rest. You really have to embrace this feedback stage, which means being vulnerable. It means showing things that aren't done, but it is worth it. On the flip side, getting great feedback and not having the time to address it is incredibly painful. Trust us, it happens to us every single day. Equally, spending time to write excellent feedback like Laura's described, only to hear that it's too late to change anything, is terrible and frankly a waste of everybody's time. You can even look for feedback on a concept, not an actual product, before you make anything. Get feedback on your idea and see if other people are as excited about it as you are. Tip number nine is to give feedback on giving feedback. As I mentioned right at the beginning, feedback is totally a two-way street. Developers, your game can get better, but so can the way your players give you feedback. So give them that feedback and then listen to see if there's feedback from them on how you gave that feedback in the first place. Feedback can only thrive in an atmosphere of mutual respect. So now I'm just going to go through some of the key messages, the key takeaways that we'd like you to leave this presentation with. Uh, number one, feedback is an emotional journey for both parties, but it is incredibly worthwhile and the success of your product will hinge on your ability to take, give, receive feedback. So a bunch of tips for receiving feedback. Feedback is the best way to improve your product. Make sure that you get feedback early as possible in development and get feedback from as many different sources as you can. Make sure you ask why and understand the feedback that your reviewers are giving you. Make sure you prioritize your changes or prioritize those that elements of feedback that you want to implement around your vision and your target audience. And the thing I said about making sure you have got enough time to make change, please make sure you leave at least 25% of your development time to receive and implement feedback. And some tips for giving feedback, focus your feedback on the things that matter, edit your feedback before you give it and get feedback on your feedback. That is it. I would like to say thanks for listening to us talking about this. We're both incredibly passionate about this subject. And please, if anyone has got any questions, chuck it in the text, shout from the rooftop any way you can to get us your questions and we will do our best to reply to them. What have you got, Chris? Brilliant. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, Laura, I think you can stop sharing the screen now. Sure. And uh, going... I've lost the button. Oh, it's over there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a technological person. I can do this. That's okay. There we go. <laughs> um, I wanted to start off while we're waiting for the questions to come in in the Q and A um, in the Q and A panel. I wanted to ask, uh, what was some unexpected feedback that you you have received? Oh Christ! Oh my word! Um, uh, so much of it. Um. <laughs> I, I, it's quite often the case that players will walk around an environment and will say, oh, did you know that that thing looks like this? Or did you know that this thing you've put in the game is a bit like this thing that I've experienced somewhere else? As games designers, there are so many different um, types of games or types of experiences or emotions or whatever. A player, any player can draw similarities between a thing that they have seen and something else that they have seen or experienced somewhere else. And sometimes there'll be things that are deliberate and planned by us, and sometimes they're in, in completely accidental. And we can we can then go, oh, right, that thing's appeared somewhere else. Let's go and check it out. Let's make sure this whole thing isn't some horrible bit of plagiarism that looks like it's been stolen from another game. Or let's go and play that other thing and learn about the experiences they had or how they solved the problems or, or challenges that we've got in this. So it's, it's yeah, it's when a player identifies a connection between the thing you have made and something else and that is a connection that was unintentional undesigned and that often leads you down a rabbit hole to some amazing discoveries 
my uh, my feedback is normally to do with art things so it'll be something I think the weirdest one I noticed just this week actually was I was playing something and I was so distracted by a really cool thing that one of my team had put in the background that I couldn't play the game properly <laughs> so like it's just kind of one of my jobs is is managing those moments and making sure that um you can you know we're not taking away from what the actual design of the game is by making it unplayable we're actually enhancing and and drawing focus to the areas that need focus drawn to them uh, rather than distracting and making people unable to play um fair enough yeah one of the interesting things about having a live product is as soon as you have an update that goes live, a game like RuneScape, you know, you've got millions or you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people playing every month. Uh, and um, you've got a new update that's gone into the game. And even though you have tested the hell out of it, even though you've got as much feedback as you possibly can, uh, you've suddenly got hundreds of thousands, millions of people looking at this and they're going to find bugs. They're going to find things in different ways that you weren't expecting. The really interesting thing for me is when the law hounds, the people that fundamentally understand the fabric of your universe better than the people that wrote it in the first place will, will suddenly go, oh, you've made reference to this character. Did you know that this character said this in this other quest? And now you're saying... You know, you, now you've come up with something that contradicts this thing that you've said somewhere else. It's a bit like those crazy videos that you see, or or like the the episode of The Simpsons where. Uh, you know, there's a crowd of people asking in the itchy and scratchy voices what happened in episode X, Y, Z, or whatever. So you've like, you'll get a bunch of feedback that's like. I never realized that that was the case. How, what the hell am I going to do about that? It's already live. It's live. It's out there in the real world. How am I going to respond to that? And uh, retconning is, is an interesting thing uh, when it comes to narrative design. And, okay, how are we going to make sense of this story that we've just told that is completely at odds with this other thing that we told 20 years ago mm. that none That's of us kind of that, so, that, that um, is a crazy thing. Just in terms of uh, just in terms of uh, general terms, retconning is. Oh, uh, right. Um, so sometimes you need to add narrative to justify other narrative that you've added in the game. So it's it's almost like okay, I have said that the clock is blue, but. It's, 15 years ago i said that the clock was red so now i have to add something to the game that justifies how the clock changed from being red to blue fair enough thanks that's a lot that, for that, that, yeah I, I that's the most simple way i can describe it so we have a question uh, a question from uh delano um when receiving comments on the game that uh on the games you make there are times where there isn't enough time to fix everything and you get feedback for it how does this affect the game designer uh, it's really demoralizing like to be honest there's there's a bug in heaven's fault that uh we never had time to fix and we can't reproduce it and i hate it i hate it so much every time somebody brings it so much i die a little bit inside because i know that there's nothing i can do and none of us can do anything about it and um so like it's amazing that people take the time to give you that feedback but when you can't do anything it it just lives there like this thing on your shoulder that's like you failed at something <laughs> like uh i would just say you have to be disciplined about it um there is not an infinite time in the world to do an infinite number of things you have to be disciplined. You have to prioritize the stuff that you think is going to make a difference. And uh, you have to consider how important those things are and how that impacts on the development time that you've got left. There is always going to be stuff left on the cutting room floor. There is always going to be features that you wanted to add. There's always going to be some little improvement. Oh, if only I could have just added that one extra line to that piece of dialogue. Or if, if only I could have like remodeled that asset that I added to the game there and it, there, there is no such thing as a perfect product and i would challenge anyone that says that that is the case every single developer every whether you're a designer or a tester or an artist it doesn't matter there is always going to be something that you feel is unfinished about that experience and you, and and you just have to be disciplined enough to realize that 
Um, games jams are particularly hard, right? When you've got a very, very limited amount of time to do something, you, it's almost like you have to be super disciplined to do that. It's really interesting that, you know, I have veterans of the industry that would not do a weekend games jam because they find it so difficult to fit in, to be so disciplined and fit it into such a small amount of time. So, yeah, what the answer to your question is, you will never learn how to deal with it truly there will always be something floating on your shoulder going i wish i could have done that thing but the reality is that that is not that, that is not possible and they will and it will always be the case and you just have to learn how to be disciplined about it how to structure your feedback how to prioritize and move on the if i can just defend it the really interesting thing is like if you think about how games are delivered these days like you know pushing an update to steam is basically just putting a button so releasing on steam you can add content like if people ask for something you can you know there's it's much easier to kind of get that added whereas on switch and playstation i think it's a lot harder to to kind of get an update to get the feedback for the things oh, yes. that people want and um the other thing to consider like i know people rail about day one patches everyone hates day one patches but like when you master a game when you finish it for release that's often like a month or six weeks before the game actually gets to you and in those six weeks everyone is madly fixing all of the things that they really 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 wanted to get to you and that's what's in the day one patch like it's not like they they just didn't finish the game in time this is all the we wanted to do this because it was going to make things better but it wasn't absolutely vital for the game or we had this feedback and we really really want to give this to you those are all those things that are being added post-launch because people had to prioritize and get the really really big things done and then all of these things that make your lives better like they had to they had to come second but like people do work so hard to make sure that they do get to you in the end yeah no that's a really good point and i think uh we also have a question from eldred and to to answer this i'll give a bit of feed uh, of uh, context so on tuesday i mentioned that uh, a game uh, when a game releases, uh, no game actually releases uh, fully finished, right? Um, so what Eldred is asking is that uh, it is one of the reasons why most games uh, aren't finished because of the developers requesting for feedback, or is that partly the reason? <laughs> is that... Hmm. Hmm. Firstly, but... if I just say, it's really yeah, expensive to move launch dates. Hmm. So, like, you plan to release a game on a certain date, and then particularly for large games that have large marketing budgets and, and things like that, you know, they'll start their marketing campaigns like a year in advance. So if you suddenly go, I can't release in whatever date, looking at you, Cyberpunk, um, I, I need to release six months later. Like the monumental effort to make that happen is huge. So people can't really delay unless they have a lot of money and a lot of backing. And so then you end up having to squish your product into the time that is available to you. And that's the point at which you have to start making really harsh decisions about what is going to make it into that release and what isn't going to make it into that release. And also how hard are you going to make your people work? Because crunch is bad. People don't crunch, but people still get asked to do it. And like you shouldn't, but it happens. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really tricky. Mm. So I would say um, it, it might, so the, your question was um, whether or not feedback contributes to the unfinished status of a game, right? So I would say that quite often, and we talked in the, we, in the talk, we talked about prioritizing feedback and quite often um, the most important thing that a game needs to do is um, is present the kind of core experience. Now, there are lots of different sorts of games and, and my experience with, with MMORPG design, and there is the kind of core loop. There is the number one activity that the player is gonna be doing at any one time. That is considered to be the core of the game. You must make sure that you get that core right before you do anything else. And quite often you'll get a whole bunch of feedback on what that core experience is. And you realize that suddenly you've got to divert a whole lot 
of attention that you were going to give to all these fringe features around the core that now you can't do because you've got a whole bunch of feedback on on the uh, core experience that might be bugs you need to fix that might be players not understanding certain elements of the core it might be suddenly you've got a bunch of players that are doing things in a completely different way than you were expecting and those things are much more important than all of those fringe features that exist outside of the core gameplay. It's often those fringe features that are unfinished when a project goes to launch. Because ultimately, if those fringe features weren't there, then it wouldn't affect the core, it wouldn't affect the saleability, it wouldn't affect your, your, your gamer score on PC Gamer or whatever, right? It's not going to affect those things. They're important things to the experience, but they're not important things to the core fundamentals of the game. And those are the things that would be unfinished. You might say to yourself, well, why not just cut those things from the game completely? But actually removing some of those fringe features might be even more expensive from a development perspective than finishing them in the first place. So they kind of hang around on the edges. They aren't quite right. Later updates will ensure that those things are, you know, function properly. They might have even crudely tried to remove them from the game, but there'll still be mentions or references to systems that just simply don't exist. Um, that's the reality of the situation. Prioritize your core, get your core right, then make sure that you can spend attention on other those other features. But if you can't, it shouldn't affect your release date, really. Cool. Uh, speaking uh, speaking of this, I think this also answers the question from Peter, uh, who says, following around the feedback, you will have a list of things you want to proceed with and make changes to. What are some good ways of writing up or triaging that feedback? For example, a programmer is going to write notes very differently from an artist. And how do you balance all of those within the project producing timeline? Um, I would say communication. Communication is a key. Communication between departments. You might all write different language. You might all communicate in a completely different way. But if you are a unified team, you understand those things. And there is a shared understanding, a shared... Um, uh, a, a shared priority list in terms of what must be done and why it must be done. That is fundamentally the role of a producer when they're making sure that all those departments are kind of talking and communicating with each other and uh, like almost like as a central, uh, central conduit. Uh, if you're working in teams to make your games, give someone that role. Give someone that role and make sure that everybody else is communicating with each other and making sure that you have a shared ambition for what you're trying to do for the project and that the, and that the priorities associated with that project are shared between everyone amongst the team. And on a basic level, like I said in the talk, just probe people, just ask questions. Like, you know, if somebody's written something in feedback that you don't understand, go back to that and just ask them more questions. Like talk to them on a one-to-one -one basis find out exactly what they meant when they said something just like it's communication at the end of the day and you can dive as far into that into what they said as you want but it's all about just figuring out exactly what the problem issue is exactly what they had the issue with in the first place and sort of learning to remove the noise from what they're saying uh and and get to right to the heart of the issue hmm. I think uh, this also ties into another one of the another one of the questions that we have. Um, but first, I wanted to mention that that does that is the role of a producer, right? Within a th that's within the remit of a, of a producer when it, you look at what different job roles do. They are there to help be, help the developers prioritize the features and to say, well, I completely understand that you artist really care about i don't know the way that the skirt looks oh, and the awesome. fact that somebody caught <laughs> on to the fact that it's not like a victorian era skirt it's like a georgian era skirt but it's more important that we fix the fact that the player falls through the floor um so oh, it isn't wearing a skirt <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> uh so one question that's a whole other game that's not that there. <laughs> Uh, I, I get yes. I mean, it is very different from studio to studio, but I that is the number one thing that I ask my producer to do mm. is, is to act as that con is that communication conduit that ties all the different departments together and and helps to prioritize and communicate those priorities uh, prioritizations. Mm. Some studios do this by like a product manager or Scrum like Agile 
planning type system um a lot of game studios don't use scrum quite properly and when i say scrum i literally it's an acronym but it's spelt like you'd expect scrum to be spelt um and it's yeah it's about working in short periods of time and saying i definitely want to get these things fixed and it's going to take this long and prioritizing what has to be done like in the immediate right now and then what goes in the weeks following that and goes what's in the like long-term backlog of work that you have to do eventually so uh, so a question that we have from um, Harry, uh, when you get feedback from a player, do you have to test it out in your game afterwards? I don't know exactly if this is about bugs or just related to normal feedback. So if we could maybe try and tackle both when somebody reports a bug and when somebody gives you feedback on their understanding of a feature or the game itself. Uh, so first of all, I would go back to the statement, just because someone's given feedback doesn't mean you have to do it. Uh, quite often someone's independent feedback will be against your vision for the game. Constantly I'll have players say to me, you should give everyone a billion gold. You should give everyone a billion gold. Everyone should have all the money that they need to buy all the objects that they should ever need. Right. And, and fundamentally that would ruin a game economy. So you would never do something like that, but equally you can understand why a lot of people would say something like that uh or you should make this boss monster easier to kill so i can get a guaranteed loot drop at the end of it again this is all like risk reward management and you know there's a whole world of things there and a whole bunch of reasons but um if you get a piece of feedback from a player and it and it makes sense to you you understand why it's been delivered that you believe it will make a positive change to your game that the cost of making that change is worthwhile then yeah you would implement it you would be you would um, build it and you would um, play around with that change um there is a there is several loops that feedback will go through before it's represented to the player um internally we'll test things and test things out and have our own testing departments there will be lots of people looking at that thing before it's back in front of the player's eyes um but uh, in a kind of games jam environment, sometimes you have the ability to go, oh, I've just changed that thing you were talking about. Does this make a better, does this make a difference? And it's kind of like live in front of you, which is an amazing experience as a developer being able to get that kind of instant gratification or or even as a person giving feedback to see that change happen on the screen in front of you is an incredible experience. The other side of things is bug testing. So if I got a piece of feedback from a player that was like, this thing is broken, there are a bunch of different loops that that goes through. The first, the first of which is something that Laura just touched on earlier is about reproduction steps. Uh, how did this bug happen? What were the actions that you went through in order for this bug to appear? If it's a niche bug, i.e. not something which is affecting like more than 10% of players or more than 1% of players, um, then uh, there might be a lot more complicated reproduction steps. So once we've understood the reproduction steps and understood the bug and what's happening, that will either be a problem from the design perspective or the way it's been coded or the relationship between a graphic and a piece of code or like the relationship between two graphics clipping against each other, all sorts of different things can happen. Um, so that is identified by the developer, a fix is added, that fix is then tested by a QAer, probably the same QAer who helped you identify the reproduction steps in the first place with any luck. Um, and then all of those things will happen and then it will go live into the game. And sometimes even after all of that, the player will go back and go, now nah, mate, the bug's still there <laughs> because, because the steps that they went through they, they didn't articulate well enough so that you ended up actually fixing an identical bug that happened that was produced in a completely different way. So even after all of that, the bug might still be there. Uh, and yeah, but there you go. There's the answer to your question. Bugs are like a whole other thing as well, because like some things that you think are a bug aren't necessarily a bug. They might be as designed. Like I've had some hilarious bugs in the past where a QA person has sent to me like, oh, the sun's in the wrong position. And I'm like, no, I'm not fixing this. It's in the right position because I put it there. Like, so like, yeah, there's there's levels of feedback and there's definitely stuff that you can discard and say, no, I am right here and this isn't relevant and they go to die. Uh, but then there's, you know, we always look at them. We always look at bug reports, no matter how how big or small they are. And again, yeah, they get prioritized in terms of what we need to fix and what we don't and others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the sun 
Does that, uh, does that, do you think that answers the question, Chris? Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Uh, and do let us know if we have answered your question. I am going to um, mention that we are running short on time. So I will only go through questions that have to do with the, with the topic of uh, this evening, which is feedback. Um, so I really like this one from Michael. How do you deal with feedback that can affect, affect a developer uh, or an artist on the emotional side? Just wanted to mention that artists are developers, like they're part of the development team. Right. Very much so. So, sorry, how do you deal with feedback that affects you at an emotional level? Yeah, and I think, like, in general, how do you deal emotionally with feedback as a developer? Because the feedback, as you said before, especially if you look at something like Cyberpunk, can be not very tailored to be useful feedback or critical, uh, you know, co constructive criticism. So this, I mean... That's a whole other kind of feedback, I think. That's where stuff gets really nasty. But in terms of serious feedback, like, you know, maybe within your team you're giving feedback or you ask people to play test something for you. Like, we talked about mutual respect and that's what's going on there. What's happened with Cyberpunk is not mutual respect. Um, and I think, for me personally, it's, it's one of, like I said, it's one of the biggest things you'll learn is how to deal with feedback and how to deal with people telling you that, not that you've done it wrong necessarily, but that it's not done the way that you want it to be done. And for myself as a junior, and I know several other juniors that have really, really struggled. Like when I first entered the industry, it was one of the biggest things that I had to deal with because you go from making things all your own way, you know, you're doing your own projects at university and you're driving your own work to suddenly you come into this, a bigger studio or a studio and you're at the bottom, like everyone can tell you what to do. And just learning to suck it up and be okay. Like, okay, I'm learning. Like these people have way more experience than me and I need to listen to them. That is a huge moment of like personal growth and just like getting on and being an adult. Um, and it, it just makes so much difference in terms of like working with people who have done that journey and people who haven't done that journey. And like, you know, I've worked with both in the past and I know that I definitely want to work with people who, um, have like sat themselves down and gone right no I need to listen here because the other people they're just horrible like um and it makes my my life as a person giving feedback horrible as well because like it's not very nice to ask somebody to do something and get attitude back like you're not deliberately trying to offend them you're just doing your job um and you've quite often got a bigger picture in mind when you're asking them to fix something so yeah to get attitude back is just kind of a bit like well now you've made my day terrible as well so, yeah, I, Mark, do you want to chip in? I don't want to keep talking. Uh, I have a slightly different take on this. Um, uh, I, it, it's fundamentally the same, but I guess I kind of approach this from a slightly different angle. Um, if there are people talking passionately about your game, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, like, sometimes those passionate words are going to be offensive. They're going to be angry. They're going to be saying things about you that just simply aren't true. But if you have a passionate audience talking about something that you have made, that is a fantastic thing. It means they're committed to the things that you want to make, and they, and they want to love it just like you do. And if they are moaning and complaining about something, it's because they really care. If someone is saying, that I really care about the thing that you care about, that is a wonderful thing. Now, the language can upset you. And I completely agree with that. The bottom line is, if you have got 100 people, uh, if, if there's like, if there's 100 people complaining about your game, and one person saying your game is amazing, it probably, that's actually not a bad uh, 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 um, uh, ratio. The reason why that's not bad is because if people love your game, they're playing it. They're not talking about it. They're not ranting on a forum. They're not complaining about the stuff that you haven't done. They're playing it and they're enjoying it. And that is a fantastic thing. So people want to shout about 
bad things, people are less likely to shout about good things because they're just enjoying it. They don't feel a compulsion to tell everyone, oh, I really, really like this. People will go out of their way, particularly in this country, they will go out of their way to bitterly complain about something. They won't go out of their way to say, thanks, you did a really good job. That is awesome. And that is just reality, right? That is just the way it is. The other thing that I would add, and this is deliberately harsh language, so I'm not going to apologize for this. As developers, as designers, we have to learn how to kill our babies. That is a horrible, horrible thing to say, but it is deliberately horrible. Every single creative idea you come up with, every single thing that you plow creative juices into, every single thing that you love will feel like a baby, will feel like a life, will feel like something which is you have brought into existence. And fundamentally, you will care about that thing and you will care about everything about that is connected to that thing. Sometimes you just have to go, I cannot juggle all these balls. I can't keep all these, all these concepts, all these glorious things alive. Sometimes you have to just kill some of those off. And that is a discipline you will learn as a developer. I, again, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for using that kind of language because it's damn well harsh what I'm talking about. But that is the reality of games development. You have to learn how to kill babies. Go. it's the same in art like you know you might have all these amazing ideas for something to put in a level but if the art director's like no nope, kill it no no just no like keep those in there like foster them for your own love and your own development someday just don't they're not now is not necessarily the right time and i would absolutely absolutely rec- uh, second what mark said about positive feedback and telling people that you love something because honestly that is the best kind of feedback you know when you get an email from somebody saying that they absolutely loved what you made or that something has really, really affected you, it's one of the best things that you will ever receive, ever. I, I did want to to chip in here, uh, specifically around the positive fit, feedback bit, because um, we are asking the people who are going to take part in the Story Jam to publish their games on, on itch.io, which is a platform with a lot of very small games, a lot of games which not which don't necessarily get a lot of players. Uh, and I feel like especially in that on that platform, in that environment, it's really important to leave feedback and to to mention things that you've liked about the games that you've played. Um, because those developers are going to be many times at the start of their careers, just like just like the attendees. So as you mentioned, Laura, um, that feedback can definitely make somebody's day. Um, yeah. One thing that, I, uh, that, that ties into this is from Rupert. Uh, so they ask, how do you recommend getting feedback for early games prototypes when you're not there in person? Uh, for example, could you do it by publishing on itch with analytics or do you have any other, any other thoughts or, or ideas around that? Um, there are various different platforms that you can use. Itch is a perfectly good example. I uh, it's probably a bit of a secret, but um, I have used um, platforms like Congregate in the past um, to just put in a tiny little idea um, just to get a feedback on it, a uh, bit of feedback on it. So it's kind of separate from the RuneScape loop, uh, so to speak. So we can sort of try out ideas and try out concepts on an audience that doesn't know it's anything to do with another game. Uh, basically, you send your reviewer a build you send your reviewer the version of the game you've got and send it with a questionnaire send it with a survey make sure you're asking the questions that you want to have answered i would second that um, i i've seen it done with prototypes like it doesn't even need to be on it you could just send them the the exe or the executable like and then a questionnaire saying like i want you like please focus on this thing and this thing and this thing and that can be done via google forms works quite well um the back end of that is actually uh fairly well put together you can see exactly what responses you get to different questions and compare them all so that's kind of stuff once you've got it set up it's really useful um and yeah just question question stuff i um, there's you know we'll sorry chris no go on as i say like you know everyone's kind of a bit more used to not being in person now having been in a pandemic for nearly a year so uh, i think a lot of people are getting far more used to speaking remotely and uh, you know, there's nothing to stop you interviewing people as well. I don't think if they're happy to be to be spoken to in person, like if you can get someone on a screen share and get them to talk to you while they're playing the game. So you, they give you their instantaneous reactions, like, you know, if they make a noise while they're playing something or if they swear at something, you can be like, oh, what, what, what made you do that? Like, mm. there's like 
I, I have worked remotely for a number of years now, and this is something that we do all the time and it works. It just works. There's, there's so many ways of communicating now that, um, mm. I, yeah, hopefully you'll find something that works for you. Yeah. Uh, no, that was definitely a good answer. Uh, I just wanted to ask, I'm realizing that uh, we are a bit over time. Uh, do you have about 10 more minutes to go through the remaining questions or? Uh, Chris, we're talking about a subject that is deeply, pas I'm deeply passionate about and close to my heart. I'm not going to walk <laughs> away while there were still questions flying around. Laura? Unless, of course, it gets really close to eight o'clock and then I'm off. Uh, <laughs> Laura, are you okay with that? Uh, well, let me check my extensive social calendar. Uh, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we have uh, we have a question uh, from from Jez. You mentioned agile development and Scrum. Would you be able to elaborate a bit more on that for the people who haven't necessarily used it uh, before? I know it's a it, it's a big question, mm. uh, but yeah, if you could un unpack it a little bit and talk specifically about the planning of it. That That's a whole other talk. Yeah, yeah I know. We, I did want to say that we are going to touch on this on, on Thursday when we have uh, when we actually look into how a studio does narrative games. Um, the, the quick answer is uh, break Google down it. your development into manageable chunks okay. and then structure each uh, chunk of time uh, and decide which of those manageable chunks you're going to work on and then look at those things independently and move on from those things before you move on to the next manageable chunk. It's by, it's kind of similar to something that we call time boxing. So like if I know I've got two weeks to before I need to submit something, I decide what I need to do in those two weeks and how long it will take. And you know, you could put stuff into like, well, this task is gonna take me three days and this task is gonna take me a day and this take is gonna this is gonna take me half a day. And Scrum works on the similar principle in that you break things down into how long they're going to take and, and how big a task they are. And if a task is going to take you like two weeks, break it down into small little tasks so that you can tick off those individual bits. And it's, it's, it's a skill actually, something that you learn in terms of predicting how long something's going to take you to do. And it may be that something you thought was going to be a half a day, once you start delving into it, is like a four day task. And that's fine, but that's, you know, because you figured out how, how long everything's going to take within your two week time frame, let's say, you could be like, right, well, this thing that I thought was half a day and is now four days means that I'm going to have to ditch some other stuff mm. and put those into the thing I do next. And it's, it's, it's agile scheduling is what they call it. It's like moving things around to whatever is the most high priority at that moment in time. We are going to share some, some resources about, uh, about um, project management uh, for game jams. So with, with everybody who joins the jam. So if you haven't yet, I'm going to put a link on uh, on the chat so you can join. Uh, let me just grab that for you. Now let's go on to another question, unless you wanted to say anything else about Agile. Definitely okay. not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a question from, uh, a, a question from uh, Judah, what, uh, how do you handle uh, controversial feedback, such as the feedback that happened around the launch of, of The Last of Us 2? And have you ever needed to deal with anything like that? Uh, I'm mm. not... That's one of the greatest games I've ever played. Surely there's no controversial feedback about that. Um, how do you deal with controversial feedback? It yeah. depends what it is. Like... Yeah. I mean, for example, so uh, this goes back a long way now, but when the original Little Big Planet came out, it turned out that one of the music tracks that they'd used, and I think was either in an early release or in the trailer, actually had some words for the Quran in it, and the developers hadn't realized, and they got this feedback, and they were like, oh my god, this is huge, and it was instantly remastered, and they put out a fix for it, and so it really depends what the controversial feedback is. I think like if it's something really bad and it really needs working on, then people will do it. I think there's also a game recently that um, the, the characters were all wearing masks that were really reminiscent of um, like First Nations in Australia and places like that. And again, the developers hadn't done their research, which was kind of stupid, but you know, they got this feedback and it, it I think it tanked their game, like because their whole art style was based on these masks. And ah, yes, I do remember that one. Yeah, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a it was a big thing. So, yeah, I guess research, like prevent yeah. the problem happening in the first place. But if you do get it, then 
it will look really bad if you don't do anything about it and you don't acknowledge it for sure. And one thing that I would so, I, sorry, go yeah. Mark. Um, I think I understand what the question, what the person who could post the question is focusing on. So, Last of Us Two tried to do something very brave, and it changed a very uh masculine story into quite a feminine story i think i would uh, i would I'd probably be as brave as to say that and that meant that people who were the fan who were super fans of the first game just didn't relate well to the second product um last of us consistently got scores of like over 90 over 95 percent on metacritic um, when it came out, the actual games industry veterans, reviewers, absolutely loved it. Um, but that is often very different to what to to your audience from your previous game. Your audience from your previous game might not necessarily be your target audience for your new game. Um, that sometimes a games developer is trying to do things. They're trying deliberately to be controversial. They're trying to. Um, bring facets into their games that weren't there before this is a super sensitive subject um and i'm absolutely super proud to be part of an industry where we're trying to do different things where we're trying to bring games to different sorts of people where you're trying to represent minorities or diversity or whatever um you know there is going to be a lot of people who love the first game that suddenly there's like lesbian romance or whatever this whatever that uh, there are a load and load of things that are going to be going on in that game that are just not part of their lives they can't relate to them game when you ga gaming is about escapism and if you're suddenly presenting a world or a tone or an experience that your user does not want to escape to that is gonna generate some 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 feedback it's going to generate some um, controversial things naughty dog absolutely 100 percent knew exactly what they were doing with that product there is no way that they accidentally did what they did there is very good reasons why they did everything that they did and you might argue that it was their intention to generate that kind of response um that is all i'm going to say on the subject Games developers continue, continue to challenge the world. Hmm. Right, we are the modern storytellers. We are, our stories will resonate for the next thousand years. And it is our responsibility and uh, our duty to try and change the world. Cool. Thank you so much for that, for that, Mark. Completely agree. Um, we have another question from Eldred. Uh, generally speaking, do you think the environment that people are in uh, when they play the game affects uh, affect, affects how you get feedback. For example, you may publish a game online. However, not many people would uh, give you feedback compared to others who would give you the feedback if they were to play it in person. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I said in my chunk about feedback that um, the time of day can affect the type of feedback that you get. Uh, there are many, many factors that will, uh, that will impact on the way that you... Um, the, in the style of feedback that you get and it is your job as a developer to just try and get as many different types of feedback from as many different types of people as possible in different environments sometimes you won't have control over that and that's the difficult thing and that's really what i was getting going on about with that slide about wearing different hats try and put yourself in different like mindsets when you approach the game cool. yeah anything to add on that laura uh, just that interacting, so players interacting with other players outside of a controlled environment will always throw things up that you never thought was going to happen. And like emergent gameplay is like a real thing. Um, and yeah, there, there's, all, there's always going to be something that you didn't think of or you didn't test for because you were doing it in a very like, let's try this thing and let's try this thing. And then you throw it out to like 100 million players and they're all like, yeah, but I'm going to do it this completely other different way that you didn't think of. Like, has anyone seen that video that's been going around that's um, a person putting cubes into a, a baby toy? So yeah. he starts with like the square and he puts it, so where does this go? It goes in the square box. Oh, look, it's the circle. Where does this go? It goes in the square box. Like that, that is kind of game design in a nutshell and what happens when, you, play this thing. when, when you put your game out to, to other people to, to kind of um, 
to play with. So yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah, I'll just I'll I'll just post post that in uh, in chat if people want to have a look. I completely agreed with that. Um, so a, a question from uh, that video is also about path of least resistance. Incidentally, oh, yeah. right? That it not all pieces will fit through all holes apart from the square hole. I, I presume that's the video you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, that's uh, it. So as, as, a, as an end user, you're going to take the path of re least resistance. You want the endorphin rush of getting all those cubes, all those pieces in the pot. And so you're not going to like waste time spinning the thing around trying to find the exact right thing. You're going to take the path of least resistance. And if that is the square hole, if everything fits in the square hole, then so be it. That's what's going to happen. And that is what your users will do 100%. Hmm. Uh, we have two questions left. Uh, so one is for uh, from Michael. How much feedback uh, is taken in before the developer uh, can reach an understanding of the issue in question? It, yeah, it really depends how obvious the thing is. Like if it's a visual issue, it's quite easy to understand because you can normally just look at it and go, okay, yeah, I see what the issue is. If it's something that delves into the systems of the game then i think you would probably need to have a lot bigger conversation about what's going on there mm. i'm sure mark would agree on that one yeah um it's different uh you know case by case basis it's always going to be different um uh yeah um, it's difficult to give a, an example of that really um you'll know when you understand the problem you'll know when you'll have a bunch of feedback and you're like, I don't get this, I don't get this, I don't understand what they're going on about. And then suddenly you'll get a piece of feedback and you'll go, ah, now I get it, right? Now I understand what all these other people were talking about that didn't quite phrase it in a way that I understood. Uh, and, that, you know, you'll you'll know as a developer when it makes sense to you uh, and, and when you can stop asking the question. Uh, one thing we didn't cover in the talk was what happens when you get conflicting feedback? What happens when you've got one player that says this is too easy? And what happens when you've got another player that says this is too hard? Um, what do you do then? Um, I'm reminded, so uh, Laura and I did a quiz at Christmas, uh, a quiz for gamers. Um, and we did a survey at the end of it saying, was this quiz too easy? Was this quiz too hard? And there was a mix of people. But then I could just apply a filter so there was an earlier question, which was, you know, are you in games? Do you work in games? And that's that's like our target audience. Our target audience was gamers. So I then can filter all the people that said it was too easy or too hard based on what my target audience is. I can say, right, of all the people that were, we wanted to come to this quiz, did they think it was too easy or too hard? And then you would basically look at an average, you know, overall, you're going to say, hey, look, Everyone who wasn't a gamer said this was far too hard, this quiz. But everyone who was a gamer, who, which is who the quiz was de developed for, or a games developer specifically, said the quiz was too easy. Then, you've, then your conclusion is the quiz was too easy, and in the future, we're going to make it harder again. Yeah, it depends on your product as well. Like, again, yeah. Naughty Dog, we've been talking about them quite a lot, but there was a huge thing about them adding, like, difficulty modes and like a story mode where you could just play the game and not have to shoot anything and like everyone got really angry about that but why like if that's how people want to experience the game then that's kind of fine like it doesn't have to be horribly difficult for everybody and if by having a setting that means that it's a better experience for somebody and that is minimal impact to how you implement the game like why not just do that it yep. seems kind of crazy that we don't do it more often. Definitely. Um, something that I wanted, so the last question, uh, and then I think I have a question is, um, so when you talked about fringe features, uh, Mark, you said, uh, so this question is from Bogdan, uh, do you recommend leaving, uh, leaving in fringe features that aren't optimized or cutting them off? Uh, to clarify, by optimized, I wasn't referring to bugs, more towards the design intent behind them. Again, that really is a sort of case-by-case -case basis. Um, it depends on the style of project that you're doing. 
focus on the core first get that core experience right before you even think about adding every, any of those fringe features might be a perfectly good answer um in an mmorpg like what i make uh there are billions billions of different core loops there are billions there there's so many different things the player could be doing at any one time and they all relate to each other so one system can't exist with the other without the other system still being there even though you might consider those systems to be fringe features um it's really difficult there is no good answer to that to that question um my tendency is to leave the feature out until it's completely and until it's um able to support the core in the right way um but that's not always possible to do from a development perspective sometimes you need to build your game in a way that allows you to kind of plug in or plug out various different features um it, that is possible to do uh, but i'm yeah i'm sorry to say there is no good answer to your question it may well be also that something that you you know you might have planned as an original core feature and then you want to remove like if the things that are implementing that are so entrenched into other things like mark says like if you try and remove one part of runescape and that thing is attached to like a hundred other things you probably can't you might just have to disable it and hope that it sits there quietly um and yeah i think it does probably depend on what it is as well like we've seen things like um, if you leave something in and then certain players will try and reverse engineer stuff so that they get into the code and start doing stuff that they're not supposed to and finding features that weren't supposed to be there. So if you really don't want it to be found, then maybe don't put it in at all. Uh, but if you can't take it out because it's linked into everything else, then at least make sure that it's really hidden. Cool. Uh, we have another question, sorry about this, before we get to mine. Have you ever tried writing a story for a story game and then get feedback from so many people about changing it, uh, but in order to do so, it's no longer the story you wrote? What would you do in this case? Trust the feedback or trust your own ability to write a story? Uh, I mean, the thing I said earlier, stick to your vision. Understand what your vision is for that original story and then stick to it um if your if, if your entire uh if your target audience are all b b bucking against it for some reason or another then maybe you need to do something about it but um <sighs> trust your gut trust your gut never use the data this is going to be a controversial opinion <laughs> uh never use the data to make the decision for you use the data to back up your gut or 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 not back up your gut you know it yeah i think yeah i'm gonna say but here yeah go on unless they're telling you that you've done something really offensive in which case you should probably listen to them if it's right? doing yeah if it's doing something that you didn't intend it to do yeah. if your story is is affecting people in a way you weren't intending for it to affect people, that might be a problem. Cool. Um, and that feeds, uh, feeds a little bit around my, my question as well, which was if you had any narrative related tips, narrative game related tips um, when it comes to asking for uh, or processing feedback. Because when you're looking at it, if it's going to be a narrative game and somebody tells you, I don't understand this character's motivation or I don't get why at this point in the game they got this watch. And your answer is, well, yes, but I haven't yet written the part where that watch comes into play, right? That's going to be slightly different than, say, an arcade game. Yeah. Um, narrative design is a really tricky thing and I, and I would say actually of all the disciplines in games development narrative design is the one that's kind of growing and changing the most in my opinion um a lot of original narrative designers have come from film or television or uh, book writers and that's a very different thing when uh you don't have the ability to control the pace of consumption you don't have the ability to force the player down the linear path that you would do with a book or a tv show or something like that it's a very very different art and i'd say only really in the last sort of 10 years have i felt like 
the concepts of a game narrative designer has felt fundamentally different from more traditional forms of entertainment. Um, certainly in the mainstream, I, I would say that to be the case. Um, however, that that's me rambling and not really answering your question, so I apologise. Um, what you can do is get is allow your player feedback in mid development to change your planning for what you're going to be doing in the future. And that's perfectly okay. So Laura described the idea of sprint planning, of like a scrum or working in, in these kind of short, discrete chunks of time. If you get a bunch of feedback that says, I didn't get this, I didn't understand this character, um, and, and that that is fundamentally uh, core to your experience, then you've got your 25% development time that I told you about earlier. You've got the time to make the changes. You can you can pivot, you can change, you can you can say, no, that is important. That is important to me. It is important to the story. I am prioritizing that piece of feedback and I'm going to make sure I do it and make those changes in the future. Just make sure you're referring back to your original vision when you do so. And actually just going back to what Mark said about planning to plug things in, like if you have an overall structure of like this happens here this happens here this happens here if you get feedback that says i don't understand why that thing happened but you've made it so you can plug story in there or in to support that statement or wreck on it as mark was talking about earlier like you know that has given you the opportunity to expand on something that needed more explanation or potentially if something's too obvious like you can remove the information as well um yeah as i mean talking about how to craft stories and the, the different i I came from the studio that worked with ink so i will always say that ink is really amazing for that kind of thing but it is also it is i didn't come from that studio and it is amazing for that sort of thing <laughs> we're using uh, it for one of the kits and i can attest it yeah. it's amazing <laughs> yes. yeah um i think ink is really good for doing that because you can do clever things like um because it remembers what you've done every single time you can say like well did this person already ask this question do they know this information have they been to this place and then you can surface dialogue based on whether they know those things or whether they've done those things. Um, whereas other stuff can, other programs, not that I've used them myself, this is just what I know from having worked at Inkle. Um, other things like Twine, I think are slightly more linear. You can't box things quite so magically, I shall say. Yeah. Um, I think it's always worth considering the journey of your player. Uh, now in a linear environment, that's easier. But um, there are various different stages of your the way that you do your your narrative journey, where you might have lots of branching dialogue points. You might have various different things or various different directions that a player could be going in, or doing different things, or asking different questions. And and we tend to describe that as like a branching narrative. And I'm sure there will be experts on this subject uh, talking about this kind of stuff later on. Uh, but there will always be points in your story where you're bringing the player back round again. There are always going to be these kind of choke points where it doesn't matter like what journeys the players have gone round. They're usually going to get to these like central points. Uh, and you can, you can make assumptions as to what your user's state of knowledge or state of understanding will be at these various different choke points. And like, so you can say when a player gets to this point, they would have this information. When the player gets to this point, they have this information. If your branching thing is all over the place, it might be not might not be as clean as that. Um, particularly Inkle are well known for for being able to go in all sorts of different directions and all sorts of things at the same time. But there is still this sense of the player's journey and the and their understanding at various different points in the progression throughout your game. So if you've got a player that's like, I didn't understand this, I didn't quite get this motivation, that might well be by design. It might be that at this point in the story, you don't expect the player to understand why the killer did the murder, why, why Mr. Fogg can't move. Oh, anyway, obscure reference. Uh, and that's okay. If you're getting feedback and your player's going, I didn't get this, I didn't get that, and you think to yourself, ah, but you will get it in two hours' time if you go down that path, that's fine and that is okay. Just do it with your eyes open. Just, just you know, make sure that that, that like, head-scratching moment is by design. Mm. I'm just posting some links in the chat that might be sure useful. Thing. 
Um, that's one from GDC oh, about how to John. craft. Yeah, I mean, look at any of John's. Stories. I was in. I was in the audience for that one. It's a great. It's a great talk. Really, I was there too. Oh my god. We never saw each other. No. Crazy. That's how big GDC is. Those rooms oh. are dark. Say what? What? The the rooms are dark. Yeah, it's true. I think and we were I also think... right in the front row, going like, woo, woo, woo. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the second talk, the first talk is uh, an important serious talk at an important serious conference. And the second talk is a important fun talk at an important fun conference. Um, and they're very different presenting styles, but John is an amazing speaker. I would recommend watching any of his talks. They're always very insightful and intelligent and really interesting to listen to. Um, I second that. Yeah, so I think these will both be relevant to how to craft interesting stories in terms of like what what you're trying to say and how you're trying to say it and a little bit of how ink does it at the same mm. time. Great. And one last thing that I wanted to mention before we wrap up is because you're make you're going to be making narrative games, um it's actually easy to ask for feedback. So in all four of the engines that we are using, there is going to be an option uh or maybe not in Make Code Arcade, but in the other three, uh, there is going to be an option which is text field, uh, which through which you can ask people to give you feedback, and they will be able to to write it there, or you will be able to at least direct them to uh, a website where you have a Google form at the end of their experience, where they'll be able to write uh, to to answer pointed questions, and other than that. You will uh, you will have the comment section on on itch where people will most likely leave feedback for your game as well. So you will be able to get feedback from that uh, too. 